I hate to begin with a correction because Don is bigger than I am and hopefully he is not in a pugilistic spirit this morning, but I have not been operated on in a foreign country. I was hospitalized for 10 days in Kenya last November because I had a gallbladder attack, but I'm smart enough not to have surgery in a foreign country. Hopefully. Now, there may be an emergency where that's unavoidable, but if at all I can make it back to the United States, that's where the surgeon is going to do his cutting, not in a foreign country. Now, I have to say that the hospital where I was was in a town called Naya Haruru, Kenya, and more than likely, the, the facilities in that hospital were probably the equivalent of say hospitals here in the 1950s. Uh, the equipment was antiquated for the most part, but the people were not antiquated. They took very good care of me, and I'm very grateful for that. I do want to make a statement about, there were some baskets in our hotel room that we discovered when we got here, and unfortunately, when I went up to the room to get into the room, um, the key did not work. So I had to go back downstairs to the lady at the reception and I said, I'm afraid this key has gotten in contact with the magnet on my phone holder and it erased all the information. She said, did you see the baskets? <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't get in the room. She said, well, of course not. However, you know, over the last year, I've lost a lot of weight, and I think the message is that all of these goodies are to put all of this weight back on you. Um, fortunately, my wife is going to share some of this weight-bearing load, and I won't have to do it alone. But we do very much appreciate your hospitality, and uh, I've looked forward to coming back to the Woodlands for a long time. And as Don said, you have been helping in my support for uh, going on 12 years. When we moved to Alabama in 2008, you began with my support, and I'm very grateful. My circumstances have changed in that most all of my work is concentrated on other parts of the world. I'm usually home a month and gone a month. Uh, but this last year has been a challenge for everybody. I have one more comment to make, and then I'm going to go direct to Acts chapter 8. I've never really understood why people want to be entertained by singing. By that I mean there are churches that are meeting today, and they have a chorus, and the rest of you all sit out there and you listen to the chorus sing. We've participated in some very powerful messages this morning, and if you don't participate in singing these songs, you have missed something that is important and you've missed doing something that will mean a lot to you. One of the things I do miss when I travel overseas is I don't participate in the singing because I don't understand the language. And Africans sing differently from us. One of the disappointing things that I pointed out to some of those men was that, you know, you, now you're using American songs. You've abandoned your own way of singing and now you want to sing like Americans. Well, Africans sing in a very, very interesting way and if you'd like to hear some, I have some recorded and it's kind of interesting, but I can't participate because in the first place, I don't understand Chichiwa language. I don't understand a lot of the languages in Africa. The only thing I understand is English. If I can't sing it in English, I can't sing it. But our song service was great today. Well, we left off in Acts chapter 8 from the Bible study hour. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And that's all due to one man. It is due to a man whose name is Saul, who had a famous namesake in the Old Testament, King Saul. Same tribe, all this sort of stuff. This man Saul is a terror. And he has entered houses. He's got both men and women. He's drugged them off. And he's cast them into prison. And so most of the brethren, with one exception, with the exception of the apostles, most of the brethren fled Jerusalem. Now, the church did not send these men out. They fled. And the idea that is found in verse number four is they were scattered 
about. The idea is that they went everywhere. And they didn't go voluntarily. That, that is from the standpoint that, well, you know, I think I'd like to visit this country and teach the gospel. No, they left because of danger. We have not faced that kind of danger. We might, but we have not faced the kind of danger these early disciples have faced. And this danger has presented a challenge, but it's a good thing. It's like the argument that Barnabas and Saul had, or Barnabas and Paul. You know, they had a big disagreement over a man by the name of John Mark. And they decided, we can't work together. And you say, well, how sad. Well, in a way, yes. But it had a good result. Because instead of two men going out and preaching, now there are four men going out. Because Barnabas takes John Mark, and then Paul will take a companion, and they take off in different directions. So the dispersal of these early disciples from the city of Jerusalem is both sad, but it was necessary to get the message outside of Jerusalem. Well, it just so happens that one of the men who fled is a man by the name of Philip. Now, we met Philip in chapter 6 of Acts. He is one of the seven who had been appointed to take care of the widows who were being served daily food. And Philip, his na- I don't know if his name is significant or not. You know what his name means? Phil- if, if your name is Philip, you're a horse lover. That's what Philip was. Philip's name meant that he is a horse lover. And he is going to be mentioned later in this book, in Acts 21, verse 8. He's going to be called Philip the Evangelist. Kind of interesting. This is the only time the word evangelist occurs in the book of Acts. And it is this man, this man that we have met, who was a table server taking care of these widows. And Philip has been scattered along with the rest of the people. And he goes to the most unlikely place. Why in the world did Philip decide to go to Samaria? I have no idea. Now, Samaria is just another country, sort of. But if you know Jewish history, Samaria is not just another country. Remember this woman that Jesus met at Jacob's well, John chapter 4. This woman said, this is not the Christ, is it? This woman is a Samaritan woman. Now, the term Samaritan is an old, old term. And it all goes along with the country of Samaria. And the idea is that here is a woman who is of a different race, but she's not of a different race. She's a half-breed. Now, I don't use that term disrespectfully. I think it's an accurate term to describe who this woman is. She's not a Jew, but she's not a Gentile either. She's half and half. Where in the world did these people come from? Well, if you know your Old Testament history, over 700 years before the birth of Jesus, a terrible tragedy took place were the northern ten tribes. They were swallowed up by the Assyrian Empire, and they have no further history, at least as far as we know in connection with the southern tribe or the two tribes that we call Judah. For all practical purposes, the nation of Israel has stopped to exist. It no longer is a nation. What kind of people are they? Well, in 2 Kings, Uh, In chapter number 17, we have this interesting statement about who these people are. Let's see. Verse 24. Well, I'm sorry. Let me back up to verse 22. The sons of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel from his sight. As he spoke through all his servants, the prophets... So Israel was carried away into exile into their own land to Assyria until this day. But not everybody. Because the poorest of the people were left in the land. And here's what happened next. The king of Assyria brought men from Babylon. Babylon. This is probably Sargon the first. And from Kutta and from Ava and from Hamath and from Shephavaim and settled them in the cities of Samaria in place of the sons of Israel. So they possessed Samaria and lived in the cities. Well, what happens is, eventually, these two peoples are going to intermarry, and 
we now know these people as Samaritans. Well, okay, so what's the deal? Well, later in this chapter, in, in 2 Kings 17, verse 33, they feared the Lord. Now that's interesting, that's important. They feared the Lord and served their own gods according to the custom of the nations from among whom they had been carried away into exile. So you get the picture. These are people who not only have intermarried with these imports from the Assyrian Empire, but they also have begun imbibing this spirit of idolatry, and so they, they, they fear the Lord, but not very much. They practice idolatry. And by the time of the New Testament, at least during the time that Jesus was alive, this woman that we meet in John 4 is a Samaritan woman, and she said, listen, I, you know, I perceive that you're a prophet, so I have a question for you. Where is the proper place to worship? You know, our fathers on, had a temple on this mountain, and that temple has been long gone. But our fathers worshiped in this mountain. You people say in Jerusalem is the place where men are. So what's the deal? Where is the place to worship? And Jesus will answer a question. Now, it's kind of interesting. How did this woman know all this stuff? Well, that's a question that John does not really answer for us. But did you realize they had a Bible? The Samaritans had a Bible. Their Bible consisted of five books. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So this woman knows some stuff that people ordinarily would not know. In fact, when she talks about the Messiah, that's kind of an interesting word. Where in the world did she pick up that word? Messiah. What does it mean? The first time this word occurs in the Old Testament is in Leviticus chapter 4 and verse number 3. It has nothing to do with Jesus. The term Messiah means anointed, and the term is the anointed priest. What does that mean? Evidently, it is the high priest. The high priest was anointed, therefore he was Messiah, but not with a capital M. He was the anointed. You anoint kings, you anoint priests. So there are lots of anointed people in the Old Testament. But there is one anointed person, the anointed person, which Daniel mentions in Daniel chapter 7, when he speaks, oh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 9, he is called Messiah the Prince. Now how that woman knew about Daniel 9, I have no idea. Maybe she had heard something about this man Jesus. But she gives us a clue. Can this man be the Messiah? Is he the Christ? Well, that's the kind of people that, that Philip has gone to. And why Philip would go to these half-breed people? Did the Holy Spirit tell him to do that? I have not a clue. But I do know that Philip is going to hear things that we don't hear today. Philip is going to receive divine communication from heaven. God's going to talk to him. Now, God doesn't talk to me that way anymore. God doesn't talk to you that way. But he does to this man. And I find that really interesting. This woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. Now, this man, Philip. Now, I don't know what he looked like. That's not really important. I don't know what he sounded like. I would have liked to have heard his voice. I would have liked to have heard what he had to say. But Philip is going to be an important man. I would have expected one of the apostles to do what, Peter, what, what Philip's doing. I would not ex expect this rather unknown man, who, by the way, can do some mighty works. I wouldn't expect him to go to this place called Samaria. I'd expect somebody like Peter. I mean, Peter is a spokesman. He is, he is a man that has powerful a, a powerful message. But this horse lover... And this horse lover goes to Samaria. Now, Philip can do some things I cannot do. Philip can work real bona fide miracles. He can make sick people well. He can make blind people to see. He can make deaf people to hear. He can do all sorts of things. And I think that the reason why he can do this goes back to Acts chapter 6, when the apostles would lay their hands on these seven men and I believe that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, these men receive power. Now, have you ever met somebody who said, I can do miracles, no problem? 
Well, I have. In fact, there are many Mormons who profess the power to work miracles. Many years ago, when Pat and I lived in Illinois, our older son, Eddie, was sick in bed with a croup. And do you hear much about the croup anymore today? Well, he could hardly breathe, and he's gasping for breath. And these two Mormon missionaries come in, and they say, you know, I asked him, can you work miracles? Yes, we can. I said, well, our son, Eddie, is in there. He is really having a hard time breathing. Can you make him well? Well, yes, we can, but <clears throat> we're not going to do that because of lack of faith. I said, pardon me? Yeah, lack of faith. So here, here's, here are people who profess the ability to work miracles, who can do things that these men like Philip could do, but says, no, we can't do this for you. We're sorry, but we're not going to do that. I deny that people have that power today. Philip did. There is no question that Philip had the power to work miracles. In fact, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 6, the crowds, and this is the crowd in Samaria, the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. That doesn't say miracles. How do you get, well, the term signs in the New Testament is a code word. It is a code word for miracles. You know what signs are? They point to something. You go down the highway, how far is it to Dallas? Well, here's the sign that says, well, Dallas is 135 miles away. That's a sign that gives you information. Signs or miracles give you information. They give you information about the person who is working the miracle, so you better pay attention to what that person says because these signs are confirmatory of the message which Philip is bringing. Now, I don't have that power, and I'm glad that I don't because I think that I could spend all of my time making sick people well. But the apostles and Philip do not do that. These signs are incidentals to their work. And now Philip is able to do these things, and people are amazed, according to what has been stated here, that they heard and saw the signs he was performing, and they were giving attention to this. Wow, did you see what that guy did? We've never seen anything like this in our life. So maybe we better pay attention to what this man is saying. Well, I don't have that power. But I can do some things, and so can you, that Philip did. In Acts chapter 8, verse 5, here's what the text says. He began proclaiming Christ to them. Boy, I'd like to hear heard what he had to say. I don't know how long his sermons lasted. You know, if, if a fellow goes over 45 minutes, we're ready to open the trap door and make him disappear. I don't know how long Philip talked. Philip may have taught hours as far as I know. I've heard that some fellows who heard Alexander Campbell preach said, wow, did he really talk two hours? It didn't sound, it didn't feel like it was that long. You know, some fellows can hold your attention so well. I don't know how long he preached, but I know what he preached. The text says that he proclaimed Christ to them. He didn't talk about miracles. He didn't talk about God. He didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. He talked about the central message. The message is Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you, I have to express something that's been on my mind for a long time. I think instead of trying to convert people to the church of Christ, people need to be converted to the church that belongs to Christ, the founder. Preaching Jesus Christ is central to the message of the apostles and the message of Philip. Philip preached Christ. That's exactly what the text says. And he was preaching according to Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. He also, in addition, says, but when they believe Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. I remember as a boy sitting at the feet of preachers that I respect and hearing them talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was something that was coming, and the kingdom of God began on the day of Pentecost. And generally speaking, the equivalent of the kingdom of God is the church. Now, I don't think that's so. The church and the kingdom are related, but I want you to think about some things. The kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, the first time I come across this concept, I think, that at least as far as out of the mouth of Jesus, is in the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 10. Jesus said, you pray this way. Your kingdom come. 
Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, that, that, that is an expressive wish. That the will of God can be done on earth just like it's done, in heaven, done perfectly in heaven. The kingdom of God. What in the world is that? Well, the kingdom of God has to do with the dominion of the king. The sovereignty of the king. The rulership of the king. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, kingdom obviously involves a king. I don't think you can have a, a kingdom, at least in the sense we're going to develop it today, without a king. That's just a non secretary It doesn't follow. King, kingdom. Months later, after Jesus had issued that model prayer, he's going to stand before a Roman governor by the name of Pontius Pilate. Now, Pontius Pilate is a wimp. I think there could have been a different outcome. Let me rephrase that. I wish there could have been a different outcome, but forgiveness of sins could still be offered, but Pilate just simply passed the buck. But in his interview with Jesus, Pilate makes this question obvious. You are a king. You don't look like a king. You don't talk like a king. You don't dress like a king. You really a king? And Jesus said, yes, I am. You said it. I have come to bear witness to the truth. Jesus, a king, well, again, I suggest to you, he, looks, he doesn't look like any king that I would be acquainted with. He just looks like a poor, itinerant Jewish preacher. That's all he looks like. Bedraggled, beaten, bloodied. It just doesn't look like this man could possibly be a king. But I get a different perspective when I begin reading the letters that Paul writes to Timothy. For instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, now to the king eternal, immortal. A king that doesn't die? Who lives forever? Yes. That's the kind of king this man is. He is an immortal, eternal king. But furthermore, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15, he who is the blessed and only king of kings and lord of lords. What does that sound like to you? It sounds to me like that Jesus is the king over every created thing. He is over everything that you can see. Is he over Russia? Yes. Is he over the USA? Yes. Now, not everybody's going to serve that king. But Jesus Christ is God's anointed king who sits upon his throne and the world, the universe, is his domain. He controls everything. He is an all-powerful, almighty king. Now, that's the picture that emerges when Philip comes to Samaria and begins to teach about the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ is the sovereign. He is over our president. He is over every president, over every dictator, over every king in the world. Now, they may not serve him now, but there will come the time when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Now, that's the king. And that's the message that Philip brought. He brought the message of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come. Would you come into it? Secondly, it says that he preached the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that's an interesting statement. Does that mean, well, well Jesus said this and Jesus said no. The, the expression the name or preaching in the name of Jesus Christ Simply doesn't mean that he said the word Jesus Christ. It has to do with this, the, the subject that he's taught. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and his authority is everywhere. Everything that Jesus taught and everything that Jesus empowered his apostles and disciples to preach involves his name. Everything that is done in this church ought to be done in the name of Jesus Christ, Colossians 3.17. All that you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, in the name of the Lord Jesus means that Jesus has addressed this subject somewhere. 
or his apostles have addressed it because they speak for him. Whenever they speak, they speak by the authority of their king. And so whatever you do in this church needs to be done by the authority of the king, of King Jesus. He taught them the message of Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? I, I wish that I could have been a fly on the wall and listened to what Philip had to say. I think I would have been enthralled. I think that he probably teaches thing, or taught things that we don't hear a lot about today. Now, that's not to say that in deviating from various subjects, which the New Testament does discuss and does describe, that, that we always have to talk about Jesus Christ. I don't think that. But the fact is that this man brought message, he brought a message and he brought news which these Samaritan people needed. Samaritans, of all people, Samaritans need this. These inveterate enemies of the Jewish people. Well, when he taught the name of Jesus, what do you think he taught? Well, he taught what the council of the Sanhedrin had forbidden twice. Do not say anything more in the name of this man. If you do, it's going to be curtains for you. They made a gag order effective for the apostles. No more preaching in this name. That's exactly what Philip taught. He preached about Jesus Christ. He probably preached exactly what Peter said months or years earlier. When the question was raised, you know, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that's the message that he brought. Is that the message they needed? Absolutely. They needed this message so that they could turn from darkness to light. From the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. And that's the message that Philip brought. He preached about the good news of the kingdom. And he also preached about the name of Jesus Christ. These are essential elements of preaching the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the king, and furthermore, that all things must be done by his name and his authority. Well, but you know, these people are so hard-hearted. They are such obstinate people. They, they were the stumbling block whenever the rebuilding of the temple was taking place under the leadership of Zerubbabel. They were trying to impede the progress of God's people returning from Babylonian captivity. They were inveterate enemies of the people of God. But now Philip is going with the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. And guess what? They said, okay, I do. We will. Acts 8 verse 12. They were being baptized, both men and women. Amazing. Women in particular. You know, really, truly, I hate to say this, but women, for the most part, were nobodies. From the law's perspective, a woman wasn't really important. Now, I don't think that's God's perspective. I know that's not God's perspective. But, you know, women are sort of an afterthought in many of these stories. And so what, what makes this so significant is that Luke specifically mentions both men and women were baptized. And they're on equal footing. That is, women don't have to do something different from men, and men don't have to do something different from women in obeying the truth. Each of them does the very same thing. And each of them receives the very same benefit. Don't ever denigrate the role of women among the people of God. And if you really read carefully in the New Testament story, you'll see some real standout women. You'll see some women whose names, in fact, there are several of the Marys or Marias in the New Testament. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus. You read about Elizabeth. Elizabeth. There are, you read about Eunice, Eunice and Lois. Women of renown and repute because they were God-fearing women. So the message that Philip brings is not just for men, it's for everybody. It is a message of salvation in Jesus Christ. But it is even to me more significant that these are Samaritans, people that the Jews hate. 
and who in turn hate the Jews. John adds this parenthetical statement when Jesus is conversing with the woman at the well, at Jacob's well, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And you understand why? Because they hated them. In fact, I guess they really hated anybody who wasn't a Jew. So isn't it significant that when Philip leaves the cities of Jerusalem, he goes down, and that literally down. Whenever you read about going from Jerusalem, you always go down. When you read about going to Jerusalem, you always go up. You know why? Because Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level. So you go up or down. So he goes down to Samaria, and he brings this life-saving message of Jesus Christ. And there's a man there, and I don't want to overlook this man because he's a very important man. This man's name is Simon. I just want to give just one illustration of this man. This man, Simon, is a magician. Now, I don't think he does sleight of hands. I think he probably uses all kinds of drugs and hocus-pocus stuff, and he deals in black magic, but he had people fooled. He had them thinking he is some great person, but he sees what Philip does, and immediately he is struck. This is the real deal. Philip does not use sleight of hand. He does not invoke the name of Satan or any other god. He is able to do things it's impossible to do. And so this man, Simon, says, Aha! This is the real message. And Simon himself also believed and was baptized. Isn't that an amazing story? Here's this guy, and I guess he probably made a lot of money by his magician magic work but he gave all that up because he believed the message that Philip brought but that's not the end of the story because whenever Philip sees that by the laying on of the apostles hands the Holy Spirit is given he says aha I would like to have that gift give it to me so that whomsoever I lay my hands he may receive this gift I guess maybe he's got money in his mind. Maybe he can make lots of money this way. Or maybe he can regain some of his lost prestige. I don't know why he said that. But he says, I can lay my hands on people and they'll get this gift too. Now, there is an English word, S-I-M-O-N-Y. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Simony. If you look up the word, Simony is named after this man. And the expression Simony is a desire to purchase a religious office with money. Now, it's kind of interesting, back in the Dark Ages, you could buy a bishopric. I mean, you could pay money and you could become a bishop or maybe somebody else, but you had to pay the money. That's simony. So Simon is sort of a notorious man from among the Samaritans. So now Simon has sinned. Peter says so. I see that you're in the bond of iniquity and the gall of bitterness. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray the Lord. So Philip had two messages. He had a message, first of all, to people who had never obeyed the gospel and had never been baptized. You need to repent and be baptized, every one of you. And many of them said, okay, we'll do that. And then Simon, also in that number, was converted just like anybody else. The text says he did the very same thing, and yet Simon sinned. Sometimes we have very, very poor expectations of Christians. Oh, did you hear about what so-and-so did? You know, he hadn't been a Christian long, and he fell off the wagon. Well, probably wasn't ever converted to start with. Why do you think that? Was Simon converted? Yes. Did Simon sin? Yes. Did Simon have a remedy? Yes. Repent of your wickedness and pray the Lord. We should not assume that when a person becomes a Christian, well, you know, the road is smooth, no curves, no ups and downs. I mean, it's all level, no problem. You will have problems. Maybe not as severe as Simon's, but you'll have problems just like anybody else. The solution is still within the reign of the Savior. The solution is repent. The Lord does not, as far as I can tell, The Lord does not forgive people who refuse to repent. So, Simon, you must repent of your wickedness. Yes, you must admit that what you thought was wicked. And Simon says, listen, okay, I understand. Please pray for me that what you spoke about will not come about. 
So when you look at when Philip goes to Samaria, he preaches the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And people believe what it, people believe his message. And now there are Samaritans in the church of the Lord. Of all people, Samaritans. And Simon, in that number, sinned. The remedy was provided for him. Repent and pray the Lord. Maybe you need to repent. I don't know your heart. The Lord does. And that's one of the fearful things about the Lord. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're planning to do. I don't, but he does. Maybe you need to repent. And if you, that's your case, then if you've never been immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin, listen to what Philip said. Repent. The name of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, these are all things which are essential for you. The water's ready, are you? But maybe you've done that, and maybe you're just like Simon. You've flubbed up. You've really messed up. Maybe, maybe badly. Is there any hope for me? Of course there's always hope. But you need to repent and pray the Lord. That's Philip's message. <sighs> to the Samaritans again, I'll express, of all people. That's his message. But Philip is not finished. But that's another story for another time. Tomorrow night, the Lord willing, I'm going to talk about Philip and the man of money the treasure of the queen of Ethiopia. Would you come back? Thank you for your attention this morning. If you need to repent, then listen to Philip's message. Don't listen to me. Listen to the text. Philip said, repent and be baptized. Whether you are an alien sinner who needs forgiveness from your sins through the waters of baptism and the blood of Christ, or you need to repent because you have sinned and you need to make things right with the Lord. I praise you with all of my